above the streets and houses, rainbow climbing high. Everyone can see it smiling over the sky. Paint the whole world with a rainbow. Hello and welcome to my podcast. If you like kids TV nostalgia, you've come to the right place. This is Jack's Throwback Attack. Wonderful memories spanning over 50 years are shared today in this episode. So my next guest is someone who's been in puppetry for some 50 years on some of the UK's best-loved children's TV shows. It's Ronnie LeDrew. Hello. Hello. Lovely, lovely to be with you. Thank you for taking part today. Are you well? I'm very well, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. Good. Fantastic. Well, as I said in my introduction, you've been in puppetry for something like 50 years. And what inspired you to get into that particular field of work? Well, basically, uh, this is all while I was at school. I um, started doing, I suppose mini puppet shows, I'm going to put it like that. Um, I, I was brought up in South London in a block of flats, council flats, and we had long summer holidays while at school. And my sister and I used to put on puppet shows. I was sort of the person that sort of did them, set them all up. And we had an upturned table. We put puppets on. Um, <laughs> uh, that was the sort of stage. Oh, it's mad when I think about it. And we had a wind up gramophone. And I started doing puppets for the kids that came, you know, from the flats. I mean, they come and sit on the stairway going up to the second floor. We were on the first floor. So perfect sort of raped auditorium for them to sit on. And they watched um funny really comical things really i mean we just we had i think we had three pelham puppets there the set there were puppets that you could buy certainly in my childhood um sadly i don't think you can buy them now but they're a bit like collected items but they were made for children very simple characters anyway i had about three of those i had some glove puppets that i sort of did some stuff with and um they, as i say these records i can't remember but they were 78s and i was i I can't remember how I got hold of this wind up gramophone, but it was perfect for being in this sort of hallway. And so I wound up and put, I think we had, yeah, Gracie Fields, we had records of, and um, oh, Victor Sylvester music. I mean, really quite, well, you know, very odd music, but somehow the kids quite liked it. And I rather liked doing the shows, to be honest. I think I always wanted to be involved in theatre of some sort, even at that age, I, I quite liked this the fact that I could be in front of an audience and do something. Um, but then really, I suppose the fun of it came too. Um, a bit later on, that was my start. I bought um, a Pollux toy theatre. Now that's a, a model theatre, um, very popular sort of, well, late Victorian times really, and and on for the First World War and all that sort of time. And these little model theatres were um, basically little cut out figures that you you it was a, there was a lovely expression they had for selling them they were, you could either buy them from tuppence colored these are the sheets that little figures came on you had to cut them out and stick them on cardboard uh, or um penny plain which meant that you could color in your own um sheets and there was scenery and there was little tiny props and things like that and you had this little model theater believe it or not you can go to Covent Garden in London and you can there's a shop there that sells the theatres now. They're, you know, it's, they're still quite popular. I, I, I suppose, you know, uh, be certain people that will find the shop and wander in and see what it's like. But uh, anyway, um, I thought this was wonderful because this was a little proscenium arch. The, I, I made my own sort of lighting for it. Um, I didn't. We didn't have lots of money when I was um, a kid, so I basically sort of made out of bicycle um lamps they were little you know things and we had a battery i had a battery for them so it, i didn't really have dimmers or anything very sophisticated but i was do i do a i did a performance of things like there was um well hamlet was the one i remember it was a cut down version and i'd cut all these figures out and i sort of covered myself behind this proscenium mark there was i had a sort of cardboard screen so that screened me from the audience and this was in my bedroom this time so there was probably about five kids in 
and they watch this um, performance and I was doing, uh, I remember this one scene, it was sort of Horatio was, Horatio was on the ramparts of the castle and the ghost of Hamlet's father appeared Woo! and uh, all this sort of happened and I was doing this and I thought gosh, you know, the audience are really quiet this is wonderful, they're really spellbound by my magical puppetry which of course is terribly simple they're just on a little wire and the ghost was on a bit of cotton that I lowered down anyway I thought well, I'll just go and see at the end of that scene how they all are and I looked around the corner and they'd all crept out they'd bored out of their minds because I was having a ball doing this thing but of course it taught me a very good lesson for my future puppetry work you don't just entertain yourself you're actually entertaining an audience so that was my first sort of um I so foray of thinking oh I see yes of course I mustn't although I, I must admit it was different I suppose when I did the shows with the string puppets and the glove puppets outside in the in the sort of um, hallway of the uh, flats there, um, I think that was a bit different. I could sort of see the kids, and uh, I, but because they couldn't see me, they could creep out, you know. But anyway, that was my big lesson. Oh, OK, so from humble beginnings to start off with. And then how did that lead into you learning the trade professionally? I ended up... Um, writing to um, a theatre called the Little Angel Theatre in Islington. And um, it was run by a wonderful puppeteer called John Wright. It established itself in 1961. My career started really about 1964, I think it was. I'm so bad on the dates, I'm afraid. But anyway, um, and so I wrote this letter um, saying, look, I'm leaving school in the summer and uh, I'd quite like to join you, please. Uh, do you have apprenticeships? And anyway, I got this letter back saying, yes, we, we've had an apprentice already, but we've got, you know, we, we could have another one. He's now trained and, you know, he's one of my star puppeteers. So I thought, oh, wonderful. So anyway, but first of all, come along and visit the theatre. You know, we must have a meeting. So I went along and it was in North London, or it still is in North London in Islington. And I lived in South London, but I got the tube. It was all fairly easy. I'm a 15 year old schoolboy. I had told the school that I was going to stay on and take some exams, but um, I'll tell you what happened after that. I got to the theatre. Um, I saw, actually, I went first to see a couple of shows, um, which was marvellous before this interview, um, which was very nice. Um, and I absolutely adored it. It seated um, 80 people then. And um, we they had seats from the old Collins Musical Theatre. The exit lights were also taken from this Collins musical which was just down the road from where the Little Angel Theatre was built. In fact the theatre was not built permanently as a puppet theatre first of all it was a, an old temperance hall so um, it was John Wright had it all changed into a, a marionette stage with um, facilities for rod puppets and shadow puppets and glove puppets all the different forms and the show I saw first of all was The Little Mermaid by Hans Anderson and um, it was absolutely wonderful. The operating of the puppets were absolutely beautiful. They were carved out of wood, um, lime wood for the heads and hands and uh, wood from Malaya called gelatin for the bodies and stuff. And you can imagine mermaids swimming in the water. Well, you, there wasn't water there, but they had a, a lovely gauze down at the very beginning. And the very first picture as the curtain went up from the top was there was the, a figurehead rock that had come from an old boat that had sunk. And it was obviously at the bottom of the sea. And there was the mermaid with her cheek against the, the, the figurehead, which looked like a young prince or something. You know? and, uh, and that was so beautiful. And then the scores went up and then the mermaid beautifully swam round this figurehead. And it was also blue, greeny sort of lighting. And um, it was absolutely wonderful. Anyway, I was totally star, well, not starstruck, spellbound, really. And afterwards, I said, you know, I met John Wright and I sort of said, oh, I'm the chap who wrote to you. And he said, yes, of course. Um, um, tell you what, look, why didn't you come and have a look backstage? You know, you're very passionate about puppets and everything. I was. I was very um, uh, perhaps over the top as well. Anyway, I got to the backstage area and John said, oh, why don't you put bags over the puppets? We put bags over to keep the dust off after the show's over. And I thought, I'm actually going to be handling these figures. So I'd sit on the bridge with my legs dangling over. The bridge, by the way, is the 
it's a bridge that goes over the stage. And when you've got marionettes, you stand on that and there's a sort of six foot drop and the strings are attached to the puppets and the control at the top of the puppet works the puppet and you lean on this bridge where there's a leaning rail so that you obviously don't fall off it, off onto the stage. And so you're above the puppets. I was sitting there bagging these puppets and there was lovely hanging rail so I could see all these beautiful figures. And I thought, this is the place for me. I absolutely adore it. And then I did ask John and he said, well, um, we, you know, um, we can take you on, but we can't, you know, we can't afford to pay you. We don't have money for your, your a fee for you. So what we suggest, either you pay us for training or you could come and work here as an apprentice for sort of services rented to the theatre. And I thought, oh, I didn't really care about the money or anything like that. I just thought he's actually inviting me to come. So I shot back home. Um, and I met up with my parents, obviously at home in the flats, and and I said, of course, but both of them obviously knew that I'd gone for this visit. So I um, and they said, so um, you know, how did it go? I said, oh, it was absolutely amazing. The shows were wonderful. I loved the show that I saw. Um, but then John, my father, who was a teacher, said to me, um, well, um, what what are they going to pay you if they've offered you a job? What would be the the um the wage and i said ah oh, they're not going to pay me I, it's just for services rendered to the theater and my father went uh oh and um because you know here am i intending to leave school to you know to bring a little bit of money into the house um my father's right into the kitchen to his you know to my mum, and they both went in the kitchen they were probably in the kitchen for about oh I don't know, a minute. I thought it was there. They were in there for half an hour discussing my future. And I'd sort of fallen in love with this theatre and I desperately wanted to be part of it. Anyway, they came out and I looked at my mother's face because and she had a slight twinkle in her eye. And basically they said, well, you can you can start at the theatre. We obviously you're absolutely you know, so keen to do it. We don't want to stop you from going. But we, you know, we give you sort of six months and um, basically you have three months to see whether you really like it and they have three months to see whether they like you and that would be fine. But after that, you know, you will you will have to sort of think about sort of some sort of money coming in. And that basically was the start of my career. Good stuff. Well, I'm assuming that the six months turned out OK in the end. I stayed, in fact, for eight, to, to, uh, for eight months initially and um, continued working at the theatre on and off right through my career. In fact, I'm still working. Well, when I say still working at theatre, the theatre has changed an awful lot. John Wright died in 1991 and the theatre changed and, and it had a lot of, you know, changes, different artistic directors. Nowadays, I do a lot of teaching. There, so I do what they call the foundation course. And I usually do, um, you know, two classes. I'd have done run the whole foundation course. It's usually 10 um evenings over the 10 weeks and it's a two-hour session say on a Thursday or something like that um, I been through my career I sort of had to I did it for a bit but it, it, it was very difficult because I used to have to turn down some more um, lucrative work to put it that way uh, because I was doing this one evening uh, a week at the Little Angel so I, I said look I can do sort of specialised classes which I'll come in and do a couple of evenings and you know if somebody else can run and that's that's worked well actually I've done that over the years but we used to run string marionette courses there um, sadly the marionettes are a little bit in abeyance at the moment it's partly due to funding for the theatre I mean like, like all theatre generally it's it's suffering um, from lack of funds. The shows at Little Angel Theatre now only have usually a maximum of two puppeteers in them, um, our, and um, which rather limits the type of puppets you can do. I and mean, if you want to do a marionette show, you need five or six people in a show because it's one puppet per person working the puppet. Um, whereas a two-man show, you can, or without marionettes, you can other puppets you can more get away with. Uh, they're easier to operate. Let's put it that way. And technically, a marionette is takes a while to learn. And um, aside from the Little Angel Theatre, did you perform or train with any other puppet theatres? Yeah, I, I. That's been my sort of base for many years, really. And that's the Little Angel Theatre story, but also. Um, I did leave the Little Angel Theatre after eight months and I initially worked with the Hogarth puppets and they're quite famous for the older listeners of the podcast. They um, basically 
started in 1932, a husband and wife, Jan Bussell and Anne Hogarth. And when Jan came out, he was in the Navy during the war. And when he came out of the, the Navy, he'd already set up, um, as I say, the company in 1932, so before the war. But he'd been um, very interested in marionettes and family shows, a bit similar sort of to John Wright when he set up The Little Angel. But um, Jan um, basically was famous for um, promoting a children's television show. And in fact, it was the very first television um, children's program with a puppet and that was Muffin the Mule um, and I don't know whether you've heard of that but Muffin was this little mule that danced on a piano um, and this is way back in 1946 that was the very first time Muffin appeared um, and then it was really popular during the early 50s and sadly um, when the presenter Lady Annette Mills her name was she used to play the piano and present the program with the puppets dancing there were marionettes dancing on top of the piano anyway um she sadly died rather suddenly in 1955 so the program or the bbc thought the program should come to end because once you've lost annette mills uh, who was as i say the the pianist and the the sort of presenter they thought well the puppets won't be able to carry carry on without somebody like her but they did move over to itv and do a little bit of stuff but it was really uh, Muffin became the first sort of puppet, British puppet television icon. Um, they are collectible items now with Muffin memorabilia made in the sort of 50s. I mean, they played pantos in the West End. Um, there, there's several bits on on um, social media, on um, YouTube, you can see Muffin's um, stuff. But I was very lucky to work with Jan and Anne in the 60s. We toured... Um, basically the the London parks they were owned by the London County Council then and we did uh, three park shows a day um, and we had a caravan amazing caravan which was converted into a, a little puppet theatre well when I say theatre puppet stage and uh, the audience sat outside because obviously it was summer and it was in the parks and that was fine and um, we had um, the the roof of the caravan lifted up and that we could do glove puppets and rod puppets over the top of that and then at the bottom there was this little mini proscenium with a, a rolled curtain that could roll up and go up and the marionettes and muffin and the various other characters that um jan used with Anne. um and um we did performances they, they it was probably about 45 minutes of show uh, and then we'd s take down the caravan again all the stuff and go drive on to the next park and do the same show and then the final show was probably at 4.30 in the afternoon, and then we'd go home, and then we'd meet up again at the next park. And uh, that was about three months' work, which was absolutely wonderful. And I love working with them. They're very different from working with John Wright, but it was, uh, again, a wonderful experience. Um, after that, I worked with a, a puppeteer called Clifford Heap. Now, he was famous for model theatre shows, but he made his own and designed his own sets. And the figures were similar to the the Pollock's toy theatres, but slightly bigger. But this this um, tour that I worked um, with Clifford Heap this time wasn't with Clifford Show. It was his son, Douglas Heap. And he'd made this much bigger show with puppets. Funny enough, not that big, but they were little marionettes. They were about a foot, 13 inches high, that sort of um, height. And we did Ala al-Din, Aladdin, the story of Aladdin. And the sets were absolutely gorgeous. The, the puppets were amazing and the lighting was fantastic. And we toured all over the country. Um, some of the theatres, sadly, are no longer with us. But, you know, this was way back in the 60s, so about 65, I think, something like that. Um, anyway, I did worked with them. I then went on back to the Little Angel Theatre for a bit. I, I keep going back and forth to the Little Angel It was during that early time. I did a year in the Midlands Arts Centre in Birmingham. That was the... Um, um, it's near Ed Edgbaston, it's in Cannon Hill Park, and I did lots of different shows there with a wonderful puppeteer called John Blundell, who was famous for um, sculpting Parker from Thunderbirds. He'd worked with, with uh, what? well, originally it was AP Films, but it was um, Jerry Anderson's um, set up with Thunderbirds, and, he, uh, or, and I think he worked on Stingray, I think he worked on... I think he stopped after Thunderbirds, but uh, I th he did certainly work on Fireball X or Five. All these are my childhood um, um, favourites on television. 
Next up, I want to talk about your TV work. Now, the, the show that you're most famous for working on is, of course, Rainbow, a preschool show um, that used to be made by Thames Television, started in 1972 and ran uh, for 20 years. Tell us how that came about. Now, um, the preempt to that was I was back at the Little Angel Theatre when I wasn't working for other companies. I'd always go back. John Wright was wonderful about sort of I was in and out, as it were. But um, as I knew most of the repertoire of the theatre, it was very easy for me to slot in. Anyway, I was in the workshop because John had said to me, look, Ronnie, um, we need a lot of young persons shows. And you've you, you've done quite a few children's shows in your time. Uh, um, and that basically was that I'd set up my own one man glove puppet show. And I used to go around to schools when I wasn't working um, doing the um, company shows and um, so he knew and I'd also performed that show at the Little Angel for the sat what we call the Saturday morning shows for the very young. Um, I was making a new show called The Hubble Bubbles. I'd written this story and I not I'm fun enough a bit unusual for for a puppeteer I'm not a maker of puppets so I had friends at the company who said oh yes they'd make the um, the puppets for me and there was they were the Hubble bubbles were strange sort of creatures bird like and then there was a sort of potato looking one one day the puppet I was in the workshop sort of I'm going to say supervising the making of the puppets for this new new um, play that I was going to put on and um, enter Pamela Lonsdale and a researcher now Pamela Lonsdale was a producer of this new program called Rainbow and this was about 1970 something like that she came in and said look you know you run the theatre John Wright and it's very interesting um, and we came to you because we need um, um, some puppets made for this um, preschool program we're going to do and we came to you because you obviously you know you run the Britain, London's only puppet theatre and you know um, you might be the right person to do this now John um, basically wasn't that interested in preschool television puppetry. Um, basically, he was too busy running the theatre. I mean, the theatre was very much a family-run organisation. Then John, his wife, and all of us, we did the box office, we did, um, we made the puppets. I, I didn't personally, but I mean, I helped in the workshop. And um, we performed the show, showed people in, made the coffee in the interval, sold the biscuits. I sold programmes initially years and years. You know, when I first, one of my first jobs was that before I sort of started operating puppets. So that was the sort of setup it was. We even printed our own brochures and programmes. Um, Anyway, John thought, no, I haven't really got time. It was still, it was, as I say, in the 70s, we were a bit more established, but, you know, it still takes a long, a lot to run and um, a company. So he said, no, he wasn't really that interested. Now, this conversation was going on um, without really me hearing that much about it, but I, because I was more at the other end of the workshop. Anyway, the researcher was coming around and she was looking around at those sort of puppets we were sort of making what my friends were making and there was one figure there that was basically he was called grumble bubble and he had little black eyes and he had a brown sort of it's like a brown potato looking shape um shape and but what the interesting thing he had was a zip across his mouth and when he was naughty he'd be zipped up that was the intention of the show now i don't know whether this is um and, you know, um, this actually happened. But I, I, I'm assuming that the researcher thought, oh, that's a good idea and wrote it down in a little notebook and went away. And um, in 1971, I heard that my friend, who was also a mentor for me doing glove puppets, she was a wonderful lady called Violet Philpot. She was the original puppeteer on Rainbow. And she'd made the original Zippy and Zippy was designed by their designers and stuff at Thames. And there it was, this bright-eyed blue-eyed creature with a great zip across his mouth and it was sort of muppety like now the reason why um thames decided to do these preschool programs was um the year before 1971 i think it was in 1970 or something like that sesame street which of course was made in america and the wonderful muppets and it was a really fantastic show but the educationists who were watching this show found it educationally not suitable for us English because the pronunciation of some of the words were wrong, spellings were different. And so they felt that um, if, if it's going to be put out for an educational, you know, sort of time for little preschool children, we want to teach them, you know, the correct English sort of thing. Anyway, basically, 
can you make your own programs? Well, the budget for Sesame Street was much, much bigger than the budget they allowed for um, um, the preschool programs that eventually took off on many companies made their own. And um, so it was a lot less. But um, the, I think Pamela thought it would be quite a nice, a nice idea to have a sort of Muppet type puppets working in the show because that was kids already had sort of got used to seeing that type of puppet on television and so um, Zippy was made um, the original voice man for Zippy was um, the famous voice artist um, Peter Hawkins who was famous for doing um, Bill and Ben the flower pot men he'd done lots of oh Captain Pugwash he did he did a lot of BBC children's um, voices for characters and Violet was the original puppeteer. And then you had a wonderful group who do. In fact, we've, we've, they still use the same group um, for the um, um, title music. And it's a group called Telltale. And they did the, you know, up above the house, streets and the houses, that lovely song. And it's quite iconic. When people hear that, they know exactly what, um, what program is all about. Um, Violet was doing the puppet and operating the puppet. And it did, we didn't have George then. George was the pink hippo in the programme and he was Zippy's foil. There was a couple of other characters um, that Violet did a voice of one, Mooney and Sunshine. They were taken off, I think, after the, about the first or second series of Rainbow, um, basically because um, I think they felt that Zippy needs to have... Well, Sunshine sounded a little bit like Zippy and he was a similar sort of character, show off in a bit sort of loudmouthed and all the rest of it and Mooney was this lovely sort of purple character it was again a, a, a sort of a made-up character not a recognizable animal I don't think anyway and it had a really really nice soft voice and I think the producers thought well look these two are you know are getting you know, quite sweet but let's have something for Zippy because Zippy's like he's on his own in the window and so um, George was invented who is a sort of pink hippopotamus um, so slightly camp, but really perfect for um, as a foil for Zippy. And at that time, um, Roy Skelton came in because I think Peter Hawkins had got other work. I mean, but funny enough, both they were they were friends, Peter Hawkins and Roy. They would both worked on Doctor Who and as the Dalek voices and things. So they knew each other. And I think probably that's how Roy got involved. And Roy took over doing Zippy's voice and Zippy's voice became more effective in a sense that he became sort of the iconic voice that everybody remembers now. Whereas people sort of forgotten because he only did, as I say, Peter only did the two series, I think it was. And and his voice was sort of, oh, hello, I am Zippy. It was a bit slower and a bit sort of bit like that whereas Roy's was much more like that you know <laughs> you know and all it was a slightly more vibrant character and of course Roy was able to because of being a an, uh, as well as a wonderful character actor he was also a brilliant voice artist and in a way he was well known for being the you know a voice artist in a sense more than as an actor in, in the end because that seemed to be where all the work was coming to for him but um he also did the voice of george so you'd have this sort of zip going oh hello i'm zippy i'm george as well and i really really nice and george, that was sort of george's voice that's my interpretation of those characters and um and it sort of took off um violet sadly um injured her back one of her discs went or something because you know when in the early days of doing sort of television or oh, for puppeteers we we never i mean in puppetry generally, you really don't earn an awful lot of money. And suddenly, you know, we were earning something like £125 a week. Well, you know, in 1971, 1972, that sort of time, that was a fortune. You know, we, we'd only been perhaps earning occasionally £15 here, £30 there. You know, it was, we're all freelancers. And so one was sort of having to pay rent on, well, in my case, just a room at that stage. But anyway, um, Violet... Um, sadly injured her back so and that was a mid-series so they had to find somebody quite quickly and this is where another puppeteer came in who was a great friend of mine because we met um while I was on tour with the Little Angel Theatre and um he's a, a wonderful puppeteer sadly not with us any longer uh, a man called John Thurtle and he then took over making the Zippy and George characters in fact he made the original George figure because by that time he'd taken over or was a part of the 
rainbow team as it were and so he took over being um the um puppeteer for for zippy and then uh, various other puppeteers came in when i started there was a lovely puppeteer called valerie heberden who you know again it's such a small world the puppetry world um she did worked at the little angel theater and we've been in productions together so i knew her which was very nice so let's talk about when you joined the rainbow team how did that happen um by 1973 um, I think it was 73, 74, um, John had decided that he couldn't carry on operating all the figures because he was making the figures and operating. And we had a, a new Zippy and George. Sorry about this, folks. There were new Zippies and Georges made when they got a little bit grubby in the studio because, you know, they were, you're working quite hard. And Zippy is made out of a toweling, so it picked up quite a lot of dust and dirt and stuff. And also they got a bit dirty anyway just through use uh, so john created you know many zippies and georges um so in he was um involved um with his partner his partner ian allen who wrote button moon and various other shows and and they were a brilliant partnership brilliant team and they set up um, um well the first i think the first television um they did and i'm, I'm not a great i haven't got a great knowledge of all they what they did but they set up um a, a program or it was they put on um at, on the bbc called playboard and this had various characters that i think john and ian maybe ian had designed john made and ian operated and john operated in that show as well and then eventually um as see john moved on to doing rainbow and then being part of the sort of thames television children's department as it were um ian allen came up with this brilliant idea of um characters living on on the moon but button moon and they were all sort of junk characters made out of like a bleach bottle or a um, various sort of thing shop things that you'd buy in the shop you know but old bottles and um, stuff like that and then john created the puppets with and they, they were a brilliant team and they set up doing that well they were setting up doing that show so um he didn't really have time to do all that so anyway i was taken on john phoned me up and said ronnie would you be interested in taking over zippy and I thought, my goodness, yes, of course I would. And that time I remember telling John Wright and, and he said, oh, no, you're going to leave the theatre. I said, well, I won't do because it's only Monday to Fridays and I can come come in at the weekends and still do the weekend shows. Because that during, mostly they were weekend shows at the Little Angel. And during the week we were either rehearsing or making new ones. Um, so I didn't totally leave the theatre in, in those days. I was still single, by the way, when I started all this. But anyway, um, here I was going along to Teddington Studios and I had a meeting with Pamela Lonsdale um, up in her office and then we, she took me down into the studio where they were doing camera rehearsals um, uh, on that day and I looked, sat in the control room watching the programme being made and there was Geoffrey Hayes was the presenter of course and Stanley Bates was Bungle and Valerie and John and they were doing the programmes and um, it was, you know, it was wonderful and I had done a little bit of television um, with the Little Angel Theatre, but not quite in that setup. It was more we would come in or they'd come and film at the theatre. So it's a little bit different. I spoke to Pamela. She seemed to be absolutely happy about me joining the cast. I think John obviously had put a very good word in for me. And literally, I started with a matter of weeks after that interview. And um, John continued being part of the programme, but making the puppets. And uh, and that basically, I started, as I say, I think, I, do you know, I haven't got the, I should, I should look up in my book, which I've got a book out, which I did actually have to look up the date when I started. And I'm looking to see whether I can find it now. I should have got these dates, but I, I'm so bad. But anyway, it was very early 70s. It was about, I think, 73 or 74, something like that. Good stuff. And you ended up working on Rainbow for a very long time, didn't you? I stayed with Rainbow till 1996 I think it was the last rain but that was a, with a different company in a sense because Thames Television lost its franchise in 1992 and um, Rainbow was no longer uh, in the form of sort of Thames version um, but um, so there we are um, that's my Rainbow stories but in in the meantime during that period I was very lucky to work with other films once you sort of start in television um there's there's breaks of course you know it's not 20 you know it's not sort of 52 weeks a year you have a, a i think we had originally with rainbow it was 
I think a 26 week period. And so you, then that was broken up in various segments. And then you'd have a break during the summer, which meant I could do summer seasons with other companies or other films or whatever. Uh, and then start again um, in the autumn and do another series. And then that would finish just sort of before Christmas, sort of maybe the end of October, beginning of November, leaving me time to do a Christmas season at the Little Angel Theatre. So it worked perfectly for me. And the other thing with Rainbow was the sort of week when we were under contract with them was that we'd have what we call a read through of we used to record three programmes a week. So we'd have a read through in Teddington Yacht Club. Sounds very grand. It wasn't really all that grand, but it was just around the corner from the Teddington Studios. And we'd sit in there and read through three scripts with the director and producer and the um, PA who would time it and make sure that we all sort of, you know, performed the script to the, the right time because obviously everything is tightly timed. And, um, and then the producer would go away and then Friday afternoon we just plot to various moves and we didn't have any sets there it was very much just tape on the floor and we sat on chairs sort of and leaned the puppets against the table we were visible you know there it was in a way the rehearsals for us weren't really effective a sense that we didn't have a monitor or anything to look at our puppets we were and we weren't hidden we were there but anyway that was how we did it and then um as tuesday the producer would come back oh so we the weekends we'd learn the lines and then uh, the monday we'd come in and do a, a run through and usually monday morning or monday afternoon or sunday we'd have the the the, the morning off so it was only an afternoon and then an, an afternoon on the tuesday so that was really quite good and then wednesday and thursday were the busy days that would be the um basically the studio days we record two programs on the wednesday and one program on the thursday and any pickups we'd do on thursday if there was any necessary to do anything um anything else but that you know basically didn't normally happen and then the, the whole thing would have you know start again which meant that i could come back on friday say we had a um uh, read through on Friday morning, Friday afternoon, I could do a quick rehearsal at the Little Angel Theatre ready for the weekend. So it all, as I say, it all worked out very well. So there are two things that happened in Rainbow that have kind of become big internet sensations over the years. Ah, right. OK. One of them being the very early Rainbows. Lots of people saying that the, the early version of Bongle was absolutely ah, yes. frightening. And the other right. moment, um, which we have to say wasn't really a, an episode broadcast on TV, contrary to popular belief, but the, the famous Twangers clip. Ah, right. Well, I can tell you both uh, both stories. Um, the original Bungle was quite fun. He was played by John Leeson, who was famous for K-9 on, on Doctor Who and lots of other stuff. Um, and I don't know why, but the designers made it. And it, it, to be honest, I've heard John talk about it. And uh, he said, he, you know, he wondered why, you know, it was quite frightening um, to people. And people have said, oh, what is this awful monster? You know, that was next to um, David Cook, who was the present, the original presenter. That's the story there. And I think it was about two or three series, the early days that they did. And then they did change over, um, certainly when Stanley Bates, who was bungle bear for quite a few years um certainly was bungle bear by the time i joined in 74 73 um that was um you know they they, they changed this to the familiar bungle that everybody knows now but uh no that was the story really i just think they probably you know didn't have the experience they didn't know quite must make a master so he could see but the eyes i totally agree they were quite starey and this, and a strange sort of mixture of fur, too. But um, I think he did incredibly well. When you think about, um, it's really hard moving about in one of those costumes. You're, you're you're quite blind. You can only sort of see straight ahead of you. You can't sort of see to the side of you. And you, know, you have to really look down to be able to see props. And he was picking up all sorts of things like boats and things that they were putting on a you know sort of um, a big bath for a water sea you know a show that they were doing. And various other things. I've, I've watched some of the early ones, actually. They, they've been putting them out on a, a page on Facebook. And um, somebody has been finding all the, the very first series, which is quite interesting to see, you know, the way it changed and got carried away. And you can hear um, um, Peter Hawkins's voice, too, on that um, thing. It's sort of, I, 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 I
than Roy did, which, but you know, there you go. It develops, doesn't it? These things do. Now I get on to the Twangers episode. That is, is, is probably the most famous thing that, and I get asked this question a lot, so don't worry. It's, um, and I will explain. In 1976, um, we always had a little bit more time on a Thursday. Wednesday was a two programme shoot, so we were pretty busy. We went on till eight o'clock at night. But on Thursday, I think we finished usually about 6.30 or something, just filming the one programme. And the people, the VTR people upstairs, who obviously record all these programmes for us, they're all up in wherever they are, uh, came down and talked to the producer of the programme. And I think at that time it was Charles Warren. I think Pamela had gone by then, I think, I think I'm right in saying that, anyway, um, and said, look, could we do something, could we use some of the outtakes or something, you know, or to, because we have this thing, it's what we call the Christmas takes, uh, just for the VTR people, um, and we share them with the BBC and um, ITV, and we, they edit it all together and they show it internally, it doesn't go out publicly, blah, 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 you know, that's it. And, you know, you get all sorts of things like news readers um, maybe possibly saying expletive or dropping a script or, you know, comedians doing all sorts of stuff. So they thought rain would be hilarious. We could do that. So we thought together now, Charles said, yes, we can do this. We've got a bit of time on a Thursday. Um, and if the cameramen are happy, we'll just go on for a half an hour doing this a little bit. Well, during the lunch hour, we all wrote. In fact, Roy and Stanley, I think, between them wrote most of it together. And um, and so we called it. I mean, it's a sort of it's known as the Twangers episode because what we did was it was like schoolboy humour. None of the puppets or the characters swore, but we started off. I mean, Zippy's famous line was one sort of, skid, two skid, three skid, four. Oh. And then George was oh, I really got a little one. And then Jane would say, somebody's been playing with my knockers. I can't. And she'd come in and she's got this wooden sort of thing where a hammer and there that you can hammer them in so it's do you know what I mean everything was visual so if but all double you know innuendo really and it was all sort of that sort of thing and Jeffrey would be playing with his balls well of course he's got balls you know he's playing playing um with tennis balls or whatever throwing them up in the air and then um um everyone always thinks it's Jane Rod and Freddie that came in in fact it was Jane Rod and um Roger Roger Walker who was um, a singer for a short while. Anyway, he came in and said, oh, somebody's broken my, I can't remember his guitar, or a, I can't remember the lines now, isn't it awful? But we did it. Um, how we kept straight faces, I do not know, but we did. Um, and we also, you know, we did that song at the end and we all had the twangers, I'm playing with my twanger. And of course, and we used actual twangers in the actual series. You know, it was always a shoebox with elastic band over it. And you bong, bong, bong. And that's what we did quite a lot because the puppets could play that. You know, small, tiny things we couldn't handle because we only had one arm. And the, uh, the other hand was working the head of the puppet. And so we could place the shoebox down on the table and go clong, 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 you know. Or one would hold the box and the other one would, you know, um, twang it, as it were. So they were known as twangers. But that was the story of that. And it's become, I mean, again, it wasn't shown until, I don't know when it was exactly shown. They first appeared suddenly. And I think basically um, possibly one of the VTR people, but the late night um, showings they had on Channel 4, I mean, literally it's sort of half past one or two o'clock in the morning. I don't know when it was it first appeared, but I think, I think probably... It's, um, I think it was on a show called TV Offal that Victor Lewis Smith did. I think oh, it was that. thank you. Ah, oh, brilliant. Well, I don't know what year that was, but anyway, it appeared on that. He managed to get, and it suddenly went absolutely sort of, what is it, viral or whatever you call it? I mean, yeah. people went mad. I mean, I don't know whether YouTube had started by then, but as soon no. as YouTube had started, um, people put it on. You know, they managed to get, they'd copied it or videoed it, you know, whatever, and it was put on. But at the very early times, um, Fremantle, oh, no, this is dreadful. We can't have this. It's ruining our you know, rainbow image, and they used to take it off. But in fact, now they've given up because um, it's so, it's like people watch it. And basically, I think if a three-year-old saw it, wouldn't really, you know, and it's terrible quality. I mean, bless them, you know, obviously, you know, it's been copied or whatever. I mean, I don't know who's got the original thing, but it's all fairly, fairly difficult. But it was hilarious. And that's really the story of it. And it's just gone mad. 
um, people do. I mean, I do get asked on radio programs and things, you know, um, for instance, when when I when the book was published, the author, the um, sorry, the publishers got me. I think I did two days of radio interviews, literally from 1030 to 430 um, to every practically every local radio station. Certainly I did Radio 2 here. I did um what was the other one? Joe Good Radio London, all sorts of stuff. And um, they, nearly all of them said, tell me about the Twanger episode. <laughs> so basically it was as simple as that. We just did it for the, in fact, we won it. There was a competition, sorry, uh, to continue that, end that story. Um, they, they had a sort of internal competition for the best bloopers or whatever you like. And we won it. And we, I think we got a letter or something or got something I can't remember now um, saying, you know, well done, everybody. You've won the blooper competition for, you know, whatever. And this is all before the days of, um, um, you know, those those now they show all this stuff, don't they, on programs and stuff. I can't remember what they are. But um, so there we go. That's that's the story of the Twangers episode. So the Thames series of Rainbow finished in 1992, but I know that some stuff did carry on off the back of that. So tell us about the end of Rainbow and the various spin-offs that happened. When Rainbow did finish and we did a series, well, two different series after that, which did naturally include Roy or Geoffrey or Malcolm as the bundle bear at that time. Um, we, they had a different actor and I went along because I heard, you know, I had to audition for it. And um, because I had a set of the puppets, I mean, I was almost, you know, a given. And the director was, well, the story is that um, the head of children's at the time bought the the rights or whatever of Rainbow bought and um, he did his own version with his own company. And um, but they didn't have the budget they even had for Rainbow at Thames. So it was a much smaller budget. So they said all oh, the puppeteers will have to speak the lines, you know, like I'd have to do Zippy and the person doing George had to do George. Well, as it happened, I, Raw, uh, we'd done lots of outside sort of fate appearances and various sort of things when the series was on, you know, sometimes at weekends. And um, Roy didn't always go to those because it's quite hard to hold. Uh, it's all right in the studio because you you wouldn't know that there was a separate voice artist. You know, it looks as though the puppets are saying the stuff. But with as outside stuff, he's got to have a, a microphone. He's got to be able to see the puppets. Um, I mean, there's no problem with improvising. He'd be brilliant. But we've got to be able to hear him as well. So it's always a bit more complicated. So in the end, we did voices. Malcolm would do George and I would do Zip. So I'd do my, oh, hello, I'm Zippy. <laughs> and I'd be doing my my version of Zippy. And, and, um, and that's how I did it. And so I used to do Zippy for the voice for the, those two series, um, which was one was called Rainbow Days and the other one, just, they, fun enough, um, they brought it back just to Rainbow um, and we were back in the sort of Rainbow house, so it was a slightly different set, but we, and the puppets appeared at the window and doing these sort of sketches. So, and over the sofa, behind a sofa that we had popped up over. But, um, so yes, that all carried on till 1996, but again, Interestingly enough, when Rainbow finished, um, Fremantle, I think, decided that perhaps we ought to um, think about merchandise. They had previously um, had some Rainbow annuals um, that started, I think, in the 80s while we were still doing the programme. There were some cards and things printed. But um, once that sort of finished, then we, we there was mugs made, there were bags made purses all sorts of stuff usually with believe it or not with zippy on the front though zippy seems to be this iconic character that um, everyone likes to buy i think they tried with various other things but this nowadays you seem to get in fact i saw in on amazon's uh, amazon has brought out another mug with or i don't know about amazon but they're selling another zippy um, mug you know and i thought my goodness you know there's it's still going strong after i think as you say it finished up thames in 92 so it's a good many years but they, you know, I think it, the nostalgia um, thing is is really strong, and so people really love love them. You know, I've got a couple of zippy mugs and things. It's quite nice, you know, to have. I have even at home a, a rainbow shrine, as I call it, because just for a laugh, really, it's a it's a case with some posters. Because what happened was we finished Rainbow um, at Thames, and then Fremantle decided that it would be really good if we could do some student union gigs with the characters because people wrote still wrote in there was a huge 
postal thing. You know, there's a lot of people, absolutely the fan base, as it were. And so we went to practically every university in the country eventually um, with a little show that was Zippy and George's Disco. Started off with Jeffrey doing and Bungle. Um, Jeffrey didn't come to lots of them because in the end, the the, again, financially, it was cheaper for them just to have the puppets. And we had a booth specially made. So the puppets would pop up and they go, hello, Oxford. And this was just myself and another puppeteer, a puppeteer called Mark Mando, who did George then. And we did, oh, as I say, masses of different um, shows. But we had a sort of disco. Um, it was all 70s and 80s disco things. And that was all pre-recorded. And we pretended to turn, put the you know record on the disc. And I remember we had um, George... Um, sang it's raining men you know that lovely song and um and i had a huge water piss so i used to squirt at the students this is all student union gigs unbelievable um they were incredibly popular so tell us about some of the other tv shows that you worked on and performed puppetry on by the time we got to the 80s or no 70s late 70s 76 i suddenly got um a call from Matthew Corbett. Now, Matthew Corbett, of course, is the son of Harry Corbett, who originated Sooty. And Sooty is now, what, 72 years old now. So it was way back. I think he bought Sooty, as he says himself, this is Harry, in 1948 in Blackpool Pier, the little glove puppet. Well, it didn't have black ears or anything, but he bought it from um, a sort of novelty joke shop in on the Blackpool Blackpool North Pier for seven and sixpence, as he says. I always remember him saying that. Anyway, uh, and Matthew, believe it or not, was one of the singers on Rainbow. He was there before Freddie came along. So when Jane Rodden and Matthew turned, or they, they were the first group after the, there was actually three groups of singers. There was a group, Telltale, the original, they'd gone. And then by the time I joined, there was three singers, um, Charmaine Dour, Dour um, oh, I'm going to forget their names, which is appalling. But they, there were three singers there and they, they eventually left the series. And um, Jane Tucker and Rod Burton and Matthew Corbett were chosen to replace them. And they were the singers on the programme. And then one year, Matthew, we, obviously we all got to know each other really well. And Matthew said to me, look, Ronnie, um, Sadly, Dad, Pop has had um, a really serious heart attack. Now, I'd read about that in the newspaper. He was playing the Christmas season at the Mayfair Theatre in London. He'd done that for many, many years. And um, sadly, Matthew had to come, literally come in and take over and really do it on the on the hoof, as it were, you know, taking over from, from um, Dad as he was recovering in hospital. Um, and then it came to be that the, the Sooty television series was, um, he'd moved, by the way, like all these programmes in the early 50s. They were, there was, it was just, um, or 1952, I think, Sooty started on the television. So basically it was just BBC. And so um, the story goes that when, um, I'm going back a little bit, this is Harry Corbett's little bit. Um, Harry... Um, I wanted to have um, his wife, uh, Marjorie, involved a little in a little bit more. It's very much a family concern in the early days. His brother worked sweep um, he, um, and um, his wife did little bits. Tobes, sorry, Tobes was her nickname. She was a lovely, wonderful character. They were both amazing, lovely people. Anyway, um, long story short, um, Sooty wanted to have a girlfriend or just a friend and so he thought well and Tobes could work the puppet that was a little panda Sue but the BBC said oh no 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 we can't have um Sooty can't have a girlfriend we can't have sex on the BBC and th there was like the Daily Mirror put a great big headline out you know Sooty has girlfriends set you know or something silly like this you know so um that was all um poo -pooed. and but the funny thing was um so Harry said, well, you know, I'll go elsewhere then. I, you know, he was very successful. There was, you know, um, he got, you know, things, sooty puppets were being made. There were games and cards and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of merchandise all happening during that time. So he was, you know, in a fairly good, good, good state. Um, and um, suddenly, the, the, literally within the month, Thames Television, as it happened, said, look, we'll make the programmes for you. And so he moved over to ITV and hence... Um, Matthew, as he, you know, um, took over 
um, from Harry because he had this bad um, heart attack. And but funny enough, um, he only took over presenting the programme. Harry was well enough, thank goodness, to work with his wife and myself and a couple of other people in the show. And Matthew had asked me then to take over for doing sweep. Well, you know, what a joy that was, because I'd grown up with Harry Corbett doing sooty and sweep and all the silly things. And I'd loved all that. I particularly loved all the props and how they did and how did Sooty sit in the bath and how did Sweep have a shower, you know, and all this, all these wonderful things. But the thing went moving when they moved over from the BBC to um, I, well, ITV Thames Television, their budget was much bigger and they were able to do two weeks of filming. Um, so they did location filming and stuff as well as the series in Studio Two. We were in Studio Three, the little tiny studio. Um, for Rainbow, but Studio Two because they had a live audience as well when, and they fed in the filmed sequences that we'd filmed previously for that series and um, the rest of it was done as live. So it was really exciting and I loved doing that. Um, and so that was my introduction and I went down to Dorset and rehearsed with Met, first met Harry and Tobes and they were delightful. And um, as I say, I knew Matthew anyway already and um, we did filming. Well, it's for me, I hadn't done that much location television filming. I mean, all the rainbow stuff. We did do a little bit puppets. We did a program on camping um, that is putting up tents, by the way, and all that that sort of camping. I mean, no, the program's fairly camp. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the um, basically um, we'd done that one, and that was filmed in a field somewhere. And I can't remember where it was, but you know, we, we had a you know outside sort of um, cameras outside and that was all quite fun and we did a bit of I did a bit where Zippy was wanted to be what would he want to be when he grew up something he wanted to be a train driver and we filmed and that was just me on my own actually with Zippy and, and the film crew and we went down to Hythe and Dimchurch there's a wonderful um, sort of not full-scale railway but a little I think it's a third size or something like that and um, we filmed Zippy in the sort of, it's great actually, sh pretending to shovel coal into the furnace of the steam train, little miniature steam train, it's wonderful. And that was great fun. And then we've, we've done things like Jeffrey would take them out in the car and poor old puppeteers have to lie at the bottom of, it was a, I think it was a Morris, I seem to remember, one of those Morris miners, I think, with a roof that you could fold back. So it meant that the puppets could stick up. We were hidden, I mean, literally sort of on the back seat sort of, scrouched down two puppeteers um i mean you have to work very close you know positions when you're working puppets sometimes and that was a little bit of filming so that was all the filming i'd done really um so it was a great time working on sooty and sweep with matthew and uh, we had i mean i remember i did one with um, rock climbing and sooty and sweep had little crash helmets and rope and the camera was at the top of a, a sort of set of rocks. I have got some pictures of that and the camera was pointing down. It looked as though they were climbing up this high thing. I was hiding out of the way, but working them. But I actually had to work two of them together because there wasn't any room for two puppeteers or else you'd see the puppeteers the way they were shooting it. And then there was sooty swimming in a in a swimming pool. I had to do that. That was quite fun because it was quite a hot summer. I, well, the summer of filming those bits anyway were. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm quite glad to be in a swimming pool. And of course, you know, they'd, I'd be out of the picture, but Sooty and Sweet would be sort of swimming in the water. Oh, all sorts of things. I was up a high tree um, that we had a, what do they call it? A cherry, cherry. Cherry picker. Uh, cherry picker. Thank you. Um, and um, I was lifted up so I was high up on a tree and then the camera game was low so there was sweep sort of why I was up there I really can't remember but uh, it was up there I, the funny thing I do remember why I remember that particular sequence is it was always like games used to play on puppeteers and anybody really and the whole company were down since I was the only one on this cherry picker up the top with the little puppet and um, suddenly they said, lunch. And of course, for a joke, they all went off. And there's me stuck on this cherry pick, you know, with nobody. I couldn't move it, you know, union rules and all that. Somebody else has to pull the levers to get me down. Anyway, it, was, it wasn't for long, but I always remember thinking, ha uh -huh. But um, anyway, it was an absolute joy to work with Harry. And they gave me as a present a set of Sooty and Sweep and Sue puppets. And um, and I've still got them and I use them, you know, when I can, which is lovely. And I, I'm sort of in touch with Matthew every now and again. I haven't actually been in touch with him recently, um, partly because 
when um, I've, I've been more in touch with a, the guy who's taken over. Matthew retired. Oh, it gosh. was um, 1998, I think it was, Roman Bright. Brilliant. Thank you for that, because I'm hopeless on the years. When Matthew retired, he'd done 25 years. and I know Harry had done 25 years. And a lovely guy called Richard Goodell, um, who had appeared on the programme, I think, when he was about 19 or something as a magician. He may have even been younger. And um, and so he'd known Matthew a little bit and, and Harry and everybody. Although... Um, Basically, actually, I think it was just Matthew. I think Harry wasn't in that show when he the show he appeared. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and Richard was, uh, you know, bought Sooty Limited, as it were, because it was all owned by the Corbetts when Harry re uh, Matthew retired. And he's bought the franchise or whatever you call it, the whole thing. And um, he's been doing Sooty shows ever since. And I had the privilege to work. I've known Richard a little bit um, over the years and uh, we'd met at sort of toy fairs and things like I might be doing something with Zippy and he would be doing some sooty and sweep and you know being puppets we all oh hello how are you and a lovely guy and we um basically um Richard phoned me up and said look Ronnie would you be interested in doing sooty's 70th birthday um sort of uh, film and so that's what I did so I did the series and I this time I worked um Sue as it happened but I'd worked with Brenda Longman, who's, I think, done the voice of Sue for about, it must be 30 years or something like that. And she's lovely. We're great mates. And I, in fact, when I first did Sooty and Sweep, it was um, Mrs. Corbett, Marjorie Corbett did the voice of Sue. And and eventually um, one of the directors said, look, I think, you know, as nice as Tobes, sorry, I say Tobes because that was her nickname in the family. Um, Marjorie was, it would be better to get slightly younger voice person. That's when Brenda came in. So I was there right at the, when Brenda started. So we've known each other for many, many years, which is lovely. Um, so, yeah, and that was that. So that's the sooty connection. And then carrying on from that, um, literally in the 80s, I carried, I think I did my sooty connection in a way Although I've kept in touch with various people, um, what happened was that the producer of Rainbow, the original producer, left to do other things. Another producer came in, a lovely man called Charles Warren. He was also the producer of Sooty and um, said to me, he said, look, Ronnie, it's lovely that you're working, but everybody else is having a break in the summer. And here you are carrying on working. You know, you're going to be exhausted when you come back to do Rainbow, which really wasn't the truth because I absolutely adored it. But. I had to take, he was the producer and he, uh, he let me do about three series. So I needed three series, you know, sort of in over about the first three years that Matthew did his stint on, on Sooty. And of course he continued doing it. I did do a little bit funny enough um, um, in Manchester when he did Sooty and Co, I think it was, um, he was running the shop or something like that. No, sorry. It wasn't Matthew then. I beg your pardon. It was when Richard, was um, performing in one of his early series. And um, I knew Richard anyway through the Rainbow Connection. And I and I was performing um, in Dr. Doolittle, which was the musical which Philip Schofield was in, which the Henson um, puppet um, company made all the puppets for. And that's my connection, how I got involved. A friend of mine, Nigel Plaskett, who um, was famous for working Hartley Hare and Pipkins, you know, the sort of rival program or one of the rival programs to Rainbow. And Nigel and I had known each other since, well, I think Nigel was 12 and I was 14 or something like that. So, you know, a long time. And um, basically, Nigel said, look, I'm, I'm puppet um, um, coordinator, I think you'd call it, and puppet director on this musical and would love you to come do the tour. And so I did do the tour. I did. In fact, I've signed up for six months um, this is way back in the late, uh, wait a minute, late 90s, I think, something like that. I'm Again, I'm so bad on the years. And um, and then I actually did it for 18 months in the end, but it was wonderful. Nice. A varied career then in puppetry. Um, I, I've always had sort of things, passions that I'd like to do. I've, by that time, I'd done, obviously worked in theatre. I'd worked... Um, in um, television and I'd done a few films which I will come to and um, but I hadn't done a sort of musical because I always loved musicals you know I loved all that sort of stuff and here it was going to be in a live musical you know with an orchestra and a company of 40 people or something and big large-scale musical 
and we toured all over England, Scotland. I mean, it was fantastic, um, wonderful stories. And I've still got friends from that time that I've made, you know, and we thank goodness for social media. We sort of keep up in touch, uh, certainly remember birthdays, which is really nice. Um, but um, so that was that. And I was p p playing in Dr. Doolittle and Richard was across the way at Granada Studios. I was at the Opera House, which the old Granada Studios, by the way. But um, basically, um, the um, thing was that I heard that Sooty was there and I also knew that Brenda was there doing voice with Sue. And I thought, well, I could just, you know, I, I was, we only had, I don't, it was a day we didn't have a matinee. And about three of the company said, oh, can I come over? Because they'd heard that I was going to go and visit people over at Granada. Literally, it was across the road. So I went across the road with about three other people. And um, and it was absolutely lovely. There were so many lot X Thames people that were there and said, oh, hello, Ronnie. And all the, the do little company who were with me went, you seem to know everybody. I said, well, I know, but it was just a coincidence. And then another puppeteer walk, was walking down, was in another show. And I thought, he went, oh, my goodness, hello. What are you doing? I said, well, I've just come to visit Richard and Sooty and all. I mean, it was, a, it was just weird i always remember thinking oh my goodness they think i must you know i'm that well known but uh, i really didn't think that but anyway i got in the studio and i obviously chatted to richard in the breaks while they were setting up the next thing and he suddenly said oh ronnie do you want to work a bit of scampi i know because you're here and everybody knows you and all and i thought oh my goodness so i did a little bit of scampi the little that's um sooty's little um cousin that matthew i think had sort of um got got involved in when he was doing um, um, Sooty. But uh, that was really nice. Um, so that was my sort of Sooty connection. So I know you've also performed puppetry on a few well-known films as well. So tell us about that. Um, going back to the 80s again, I um, had a break from Rainbow in the summer and I'd heard that Jim Henson was coming over. He'd made a film, The Dark Crystal, in 1981 I think I hope I've got these dates right and then basically what happened was um, he then got um, Lou Grade who was very fond of um, the Muppets I mean there's a whole long story about how the Muppets were set up but you know he tried doing it in America but Lou Grade he, um, said look come over to England and I'll give you the money and stuff to do it in and of course it turned into be this amazing world success which you know has taken off and still is really you know, popular. But that gave him um, money and um, sort of a, a chance to go across the road, literally from the BBC studios to Elstree Studios to make Dark Crystal. And then they made Muppet Caper or something. I can't remember what it was. They made another film, a Muppet film almost directly after that. But then there was a, a, a little break and Jim really wanted to do... Um, this idea that he'd had with um, wonderful designer and um, illustrator um, Brian Froud and and various other people, obviously. And this was Labyrinth. And so um, there was some adverts put out. I don't know whether they were in the stage. I really can't remember. But they, they originally required um, 20 extra puppeteers to be in the sort of crowd scenes. Like, if you remember Labyrinth, if you've seen it, there's lots of goblins and puppets and the, and the sort of wonderful song where David sings the David Bowie sings the song you know have you got a babe and he throws the baby up which of course is as it turns out it's the little baby is um Toby Froud who is Brian Froud's little son and of course he's now the same age as my son 34 no 36 or something anyway but that's another story I won't in, won't go sideways with doing that so I went and basically there was auditions I went along with a, a beaver sort of Muppet type puppet you could either go and this was he had a house in Hampstead um, uh, gym uh, really rather nice house and it, there was a church hall in Hampstead and so we went across to Hampstead, North London, and uh, there was something like 40 people. They were all puppeteers that probably young youngsters who basically I didn't really know, but they were Muppet fanatics. They knew every character. They, you know, absolutely. Then, and then there was some old, well, I call it oldies, but not that old. But, you know, because uh, it was obviously 30 years ago now or maybe a bit longer. Anyway, here we were auditioning and you could either do a five minute piece set piece or you could go out and do a little improv improv and then what Jim did was some of his major main puppeteers would come over with a puppet and you just sort of improvise with their puppets just to make sure that you could connect a little bit 
And I brought this beaver puppet. I had a friend who made this sort of Muppet style beaver puppet. And that's what I did. I did that for the audition. And, um, you know, beavers are, oh, hi there, I beaver. And in my terrible mock, mock American voice. Um, but believe it or not, um, I was successful. They said, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, but all of a sudden I did get a call. And in those days, um, in filming, um, you got called in at the sort of beginning of the shoot and you stayed there till the finish. So it was a good two months or something. I really can't remember how many weeks it was. And here I, I used to get the train up to Elstree and um, it was wonderful. Um, we were we spent a long time doing that song, the Bowie song. We also did lots of fight scenes with the goblins um, against a wall. And, the, and then there were, I mean, Jim's amazing ideas and brian froud's wonderful designs these and the money you know suddenly this was a really big budget you know film i mean as far as i was concerned the sets were absolutely stunning to look at the um there was little people dressed as the larger goblins there were um some of them in the song that main song they were all strung up on on what I call curvy flying ballet wires or whatever, and they were jumping up and down. They had animals jumping around, chickens and things and birds. And, oh, it was unbelievable, wonderful. And pits, special pits for the puppeteers to stand. They always mostly stood working the puppets. And so David and the actors would be on on platforms. So the puppeteers were underneath and with their arms up. And there were monitors to see what they were doing. Uh, it was just, it was fantastic. And the workshop people, there must have been about 30 workshop people making sure the puppets were absolutely immaculate. And the detail on them was just stunning, absolutely wonderful. I mean, I was quite overwhelmed by that. It turned out that um, originally they were going to hire 20. They actually hired 40 people. So it was in the big set of that um, song particularly and the Goblin Village scenes, which was enormous. I think it was two big stages all put together. It was wonderful. We had the rap party in that, in the Goblin Village stage. And that's where, the, if you remember in the film, they had these rocks that rolled down a street and everybody had to jump out the way and, and characters were blown up and all sorts of things. Although nobody died. Jim didn't want anybody to die. Um, but, um, and then Jennifer Conway, is it? Connolly? Con Conway? She Jennifer Connolly was this, yeah. That's it. She was fabulous um, and really charming and lovely. But there were so many amazing scenes in that film but that led on that film led on to um the film with um i think I, I hope i've got this in the correct order but i might not have done um was little shop of horrors with frank oz directed and that was down in pinewood studios and i was one of the um what do you call it the the sort there was the leaves of the plant the plant was obviously a puppet huge puppet they had different sizes of the puppet but and i was is it the fern or the the sort of things that wafted at the bottom of the plant and um, they were a cabled. And so you had things like, the only way I can describe it, we were literally underneath, there was the, if you can remember, there was a florist shop in that film and Mushnik, the florist was above and, um, and we were in the pit and it was basically, the set was built on an old um, model um, pool that they used to have model shots for sort of, I suppose it would be, great shots of boats on a, in a water because it was like a swimming pool. So we were, it was quite deep down there. So, and we had monitors again, and we had these poles that we, we worked back and forth to make the movement of the, um, the, 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 the I'm going to call them reeds. I don't know what they are. These wafting things that you see in the film. And um, so that was, that was a wonderful film to do. And Frank was absolutely lovely. He's the sweetest man. And what a talent. I mean, Jim, too, of course, you know, I you can't I can't say I mean, absolute genius. I mean, to think of these things. What was interesting, again, with the labyrinth was, of course, it was um, George Lucas was producer on it. You know, so there's sort of Star Wars connection there, which was quite interesting. Um, but anyway, getting back to Little Shop, that was lovely to do. The songs, the singers the we had a ball. I did Mushnik's legs when he was being eaten by the um, the, the plant. I also did a bit of dialing. It's only these are seconds <laughs> moments, but I was able to do a little bit more. And I did the dialing of the of the phone. There's a sequence. I think it's three seconds or something where this little this sort of fern thing comes up and puts its finger on the dial and done. I think maybe it's only that. But that was, you know, a joy to have a little bit more than just sort of 
background things but um oh it was lovely lovely to do and that was um quite fun to do getting just quickly back to labyrinth we stayed all the way through the film on labyrinth by the time um little shop was uh, starting to do they were beginning to call us in for bits that they were bit they you know obviously they couldn't spend they were spending a lot of money for puppeteers hanging about in the in the green room as it were so we were called in to do our specific things more by that time and certainly by the time we did um muppet christmas carol and muppet treasure island we were called in just for you know quite a lot of the time but uh, not for every single day so there was breaks Wonderful. I'd like to hear more about Muppet's Christmas Carol because that is my all-time favourite Christmas film. I've loved it since I was a kid. Do you know, it's one of my favourite Muppet movies. I loved it doing that. It was a joy. And Michael Caine was so sweet. I mean, we didn't do... I didn't do masses on that. Again, we were sort of characters looking out of the, the streets when Kermit and various people walk and you sort of saw people, puppets looking out windows and stuff. But the scene I remember mostly on Muppet Christmas Carol was the um, scene when um, as Scrooge, you know, um, Michael Caine had changed over a new leaf and he'd bought this wonderful turkey for them all to have this lovely Christmas dinner. And the camera pulls back, revealing a whole lot of puppets all sitting at the table because lots of people, all the Cratchits invited all their friends. And we were some of the puppets in the pit, just holding up as though we were going about to start eating our meal. But that took a while to shoot like all these things do. And Michael would look down, you know, because he was, again, we were in a pit. He was on a rostra, although you would never know when you see the film. And he'd look down at us and say, uh, oh, hi, you all right, guys? And then stuff like that. I mean, really lovely. They're honestly, fantastic. Really a nice guy. And funny stories. And I can't remember any of them now. But at the time, I remember, you know, he would keep us, you know, laughing. And um, we could ask questions. I mean, he was just... You know, what you see of Michael Caine is what you get in reality. Do you know what I mean? Same with David Bowie, actually. He was a lovely. I didn't tell you that story, but Bowie was, um, we were at lunchtime. I was taking some pictures. If you get a copy of my book, there's some pictures of me sitting on Gerard's throne. That's how I just remembered his name. And he, um, and one day we were, we were allowed to take pictures then. But um, after that, you know, we, we were told not to take any pictures in the studio. So I don't have many pictures of of um, the films that I did. Anyway, we were about five or six of us were going the, just in the lunch hour, just sort of taking pictures of ourselves, holding our different goblins and stuff. Who should walk in? David Bowie on his own. And he walked over to us and says, hi guys, you all right? And I turned around and went, hi, hi, hi. And I couldn't, I couldn't open my mouth. I was like, oh my God, he's talking to us. And, uh, and I think Nigel or somebody who was with us said, oh yeah, we're fine, thanks. He said, oh, that's great. You're doing a great job. And it's like, we, we or we could say yes you're doing a great job too I mean, you know what I mean it was like oh but he was really he was really down to earth and I loved the fact that sadly after he's di died there's there's documentaries that have come out of everybody has said what a down to earth what a fantastic well of course he's a genius you know with all his songs and music and stuff but what a really nice guy again not at all starry and you know really really lovely so I was I was thrilled about that. It was such a joy to work for those people. And um, a lot of the puppeteers, several of the puppeteers you've interviewed um, on your lovely podcasts, um, um, Rebecca Nagan and I worked with, we did, she worked on, I think she did one of the Muppet, she, I'm sure she did one of the Muppet movies. We also have done other television work together, but Francis Wright certainly did on Labyrinth. I'm pretty certain mm -hmm. Francis was on it. And I've known Francis for a long time. And, I think you interviewed, I'm trying to remember who Simon else. Simon Buckley. Oh, lovely Simon. Simon. Mm -hmm. Simon was young. Yes, Simon worked on, on Labyrinth. Yeah. So we're, it's funny, isn't it? As I say, we, we're oldies now. Well, they, they would never say they were oldie, but I, <laughs> I'm beginning to say I'm oldie now. But <laughs> still fit and still working. But uh, so it was, it's been a joy. Um, and getting back to those lovely people, I mean, we... We've known each other for years and years and we, we, we still keep in contact every now and again, you know, um, and we meet up on sort of the odd occasions, you know, which is very nice. Um, uh, I think um, it, it, one of the joys of doing puppets is that they have these funny little mini festivals. And one of them is the, the Covent Garden Mayfair. Um, Simon is, is also... Um, works now as a priest St Anne's Church in Soho um, and he's actually um, 
um, they have a little church service sometimes well every every time for honoring punch and the performers and all the rest of it in in um, St Paul's church which is in the grounds of where this um, fair is and uh, Simon has in the past you know um, presided over as a priest um, the the service which is lovely and a puppeteer priest you know it's great and we always have our puppets in the on the in the pews it's it's quite an extraordinary thing but what's nice about that why I mention that is is that you know, I, often, I know I've seen Simon over the years there quite a lot, maybe only once a year. But I see lots of my Punch and Judy friends because, you know, being in the business for over 50 years, you get to know lots of people. And I've been lucky enough to be um, president of the British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild, which is the oldest puppetry organisation in the world, believe it or not. And I was made president about four years ago, I think. And that's been wonderful. I've met lots and lots of lovely people. Um and also, um, I've there's um, let's see, Francis has been there, been along to that too. But we've worked together on several series actually. One of Francis's um, series that I worked on was Mortimer and Arabelle. That was a wonderful television series with we all did um, different characters. I played the mayor, I played a beef eater, and I played the ghost in this haunted castle sort of thing which was oh the ghost i think it was in the tower i'm trying to remember it was a few years ago but that was lovely and um rebecca worked on that series so three of us worked together on on that but we often we did another series actually together as well which i can't remember what it was called we did it down southwest uh was it jay's was it? world thank you very much gosh <laughs> thank you jay's world yes we did that together i didn't do the original series but i did the second series and I played Little Baby Bird or something, which was great fun. But that was lovely to work on. So um, and we had fun again on that. You know, um, I think France and I used to travel down from Waterloo to Southampton. I think it was Southampton. We used to go to the studios down there. And um, that was really fun to do. So I've been extremely lucky in working on all these so many different things. And now with Simon, I must mention Roger and the Rotten Trolls which was a series, again, that actually Simon was very much involved in right from the restart. He, I think he employed us puppeteers to be in it. Um, and at the time, I was living in Yorkshire. I'd um, got, I mean, it sound, sounds terribly grand. I'd got, um, um, I'd, by that time, I'd married and I got two young children. And um, the, my wife's um, parents lived in Grassington or Grassington in North Yorkshire. And Simon was filming um, Roger. The out, the out, the not obviously the studio stuff was shot in in town, but the, there was a lot of location work at Brimham Rocks, which is wonderful set of strange rock cave like things, um, and not far from where I lived in Gressington. So Simon asked me to be uh, do the location work. So I was an extra puppeteer doing arms or doing a character. The voices were all pre-recorded, so we didn't do voices but um, that was great fun and then I did the last series of Rock Trolls um, which I did the whole lot I did um, studio work as well and that was filmed in the lovely Ealing Studios which you know famous for um, all the Alec Guinness wonderful comedies that they did in the 50s and 40s and of course the BBC took over and have used it since but um, also independent stuff I've done quite a lot of other stuff there since but um no, that was a joy to do. I mean, it's quite hard work. We were, we, you know, again, when you're location, on location, that you have to sort of, and they were quite big puppets, if you remember. And um, so one was having to hide behind rocks and you were kneeling in damp, you know, whatever, coarse bushes or whatever it was. So it wasn't the most um, pleasant um, circumstances, but it did add to the series and it was brilliant. With And it was completely zany as well, which was lovely. So that was a fun one to do. But I, I'm afraid I haven't got my list of all the different shows. I've done so many. It's really hard to remember all the um, the various things. But that's the that's the sort of majority of it. No, it's great. You've done some great shows. And I absolutely loved Roger and the Rotten Trolls. So it's nice to hear about how that was done. Um, what have you worked on more recently then? Um, I, last year, I worked on um, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, which was the Netflix series that... Um, um, still on Netflix now and that was the sort of prequel to The Dark Crystal and that was a joy to work on um, I was very lucky I I did um, 
again, I was on a, what they call, I think, they, an additional puppeteer or assistant puppeteer or whatever. And there was a load of us. I mean, we, I think there must have been in some scenes there probably was about 30 people, extra people apart from the core puppeteers. Uh, but it was such a joy to work with everyone because, again, most of them I knew and I met some of the new American ones, the younger ones who've come up, you know, over the years. And that was really nice. And the director, Louis, who was absolutely amazing. He was a director, producer, but he also did steady cam camera work on that series. And it looks unbelievably. It was so brilliant. And Lisa Henson was executive producer. And, and, you know, it was just a joy to work on. And one of the nice things was there was a sequence of um, one of the poddling scenes and there's, they were having a sort of party. And um, in the original film, there was a scene with the podling stuff. And you've got a very, very brief sequence of um, a podling. You can see his feet dancing and he's dancing uh, sort of. And it's just it's literally a pan across a whole lot of things. And that's it. Well, in this um, thing, they said, oh, yes, we must have um, a podling dancing, you know, with, so we can see his legs and all the rest of it. And um, uh, one of the producers, said, oh, it's all right. We can do that with CGI. And Louis said, no, we don't have any CGI in this. It's got to be, everything's got to be puppet. Anything moving has got to be puppetry, you know, puppeteers doing it. And that was wonderful. So I did a little, I brought my marionette in because I'm known for being a marionette as, you know, as well. And um, so, and I did this little test with, you know, it's so funny with the clapperboard clap, you know, and I was dancing. My, it looked nothing like the puddling, of course, I used in the end, but it was so nice. And then they showed that and they said, oh, yes, we must have that. And they built me a bridge originally, but the wide shop showed some of the scaffolding poles in. So I ended up standing on sort of um, a rostra quite high up um, without nothing to lean on, but it was all right. I felt fairly safe up there. And Louis was, he was filming my little tiny bit um, it took like a morning to do the whole scene. All these things take longer than what people think to do. But um, that was an absolute joy. And, and Louis was absolutely lovely. You know, I'm just, as I say, an additional puppy. I'm one of the main people. But um, in the making of, you can see they've even got me. Well, you don't see me, but you see my puppet dancing, um, and which is a lovely little documentary on the making of the film. It's actually quite interesting to, I, what, you know, urge people to watch that because it is great to see what you can do with amazing effects and um, green screen work as well, which we've all done as well. Um, and there's a bit of me standing behind Alice, the wonderful American puppeteer. I was working an arm, but I didn't know they'd include, you know, us in in that, you know, me as just as, as I say, an additional puppeteer. And the other thing was we did a lovely sequence, a shadow puppet sequence with the, um, the, the it was puppets, operating puppets to show, um, the Gelflings, what um, the history of the sort of dark crystal, dark crystal story was. And um, we did it, Shadow Puppets, and I was working one of the dragon fighting sequences in that. And there's an, an amazing puppeteer called Barney who did this little puppet. He's been making wonderful, um, he makes, he does it, uses his fingers and he's an amazing modeler and stuff. Um, Anyway, um, you have to see the documentary because he's you can see him doing it, but he's great doing the great stuff. So he helped. He did the tail of the dragon because he was sort of standing by because we were shooting our little bit. And I said, I hope you don't mind, Barney. And he said, no, no, no. And, he, and that was, you know, this is why it's lovely. It's all puppetry is very much a collaborative medium. And we all share. And if you've got somebody, you know, nearby and they're happy to join in, they do. And this is what makes um, it so interesting to do It's And I think possibly we we it's not sort of ego led do you, you know what I mean sometimes with you know you get with I'm not I'm I'm being very sort of naughty here but sometimes some actors you know have enormous egos and they have to be the star and they have to do all with puppets it's not like that way at all you you're all working together to make the one picture and the one thing and um it's um and it's that's really you know really wonderful and the other joy of working with puppets is that you're not a face um you know with jeffrey for instance being jeffrey on rainbow um i always felt sorry for him towards the end um you know he couldn't go out anywhere because you know it was so popular the program um and you know he'd call into tesco's or something by you know he'd by this time he'd married and got a son 
and you know, he's buying some shopping or something. And somebody says, hello, Jeffrey, you all right? You know, and I always think, oh, poor thing. And the other, the other thing we did um, is that I've been, over the years, been peering with Zippy on various um, television and radio shows. Um, and not all that long ago, I did The Last Leg, which is a wonderful program on Channel 4. Um, and um, what happened was one of the presenters was told by the, um, the audience that he sounded a bit like Zippy from Rainbow. And so the producers phoned up and said, would be all right if Ronnie and Zippy appeared on on this programme. And I did. I mean, it was most uncomfortable because they couldn't change the set for me to work the puppet properly. But I managed it lying on my back, you know, sort of stretched out with a monitor and stuff. But the audience absolutely it went mad and, uh, you know, clapping. And then it was very sweet. I was walking out with Zippy out of the studio. The audience was still there. Is it Adrian Mills? He's the main presenter. Show. Adam Hills. Adam Hills. I beg That's your pardon. Thank you. <laughs> and he suddenly said, oh, by the way, this guy, you won't know him, but he was the guy that operated Zippy. And they all, the audience just, woof, you know, took off. And that was so nice. And then I walked out and said, thank you very much. And slightly embarrassed and walked out. And then they called me back in again. It was a bit like taking a curtain call back and forth. You know, they wouldn't let me go. But that was really nice. Um, what other? Oh, Children in Need I've done. Um, the Weakest Link, uh, didn't you do that? Oh, point? The Weakest Link, well, that was a wonderful one, yes, because that was a few years um, ago now, but that was lovely because we had or lots of my puppet mates when Simon was there doing his his um, wonderful, um, is it a goat? A sheep, Nobby, Nobby the, the sheep. sheep. I nearly said goat. Sorry, Simon, he's going to kill me. No, Nobby the sheep, and there was, oh, David Claridge was doing um, um, Roland Rat. And there was Sooty and Sweet there, and Roy was still around there. He wasn't very well that day, sadly. But and there was Zippy and George, and we were all squashed in those terrible, that sort of booths where normally one uh, member of the, um, you know, the team would be standing behind all the, you know. Uh, but, oh, my goodness, that was, but it was a lovely joy. We just, in the green room, you can imagine, we haven't seen each other for ages. So we were, oh, hello, how are you? Da, 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 you know. But um, that was fun to do. That was a nice programme. Um, it sort of worked out all right in the end. Um, I think Roy would have loved to have won it. And I think Sue won it. Brenda won it. She's quite, um, you know, it was great. For her. <laughs> because, oh, I think she was up against Roland. It's amazing, really, that Sue just got, I don't know, won it. I can't remember the what what, how, what she won it on, but she won, it, won the, 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 I don't know, there was a prize even. But anyway, that was very good. But I must um, say quickly that... Um, I've got to thank, I hope you don't mind, um, but Matthew for inviting, um, well, telling me about your podcast. Hence, I look, looked at it and then I think he got in touch with you. He's a wonderful sooty and rainbow fan and generally a Doctor Who fan and all sorts of fans of television. And he's asked me if I would mention him just as a thank you. And I do, I really do thank him for introducing us together, which is really nice. Um, so I've got that in, that plug-in, which is really nice. Yes, Matthew Hadley, he is a big fan of the podcast. Thanks to him for that. And uh, as we head towards the end of the chat, um, tell us about the book that you've written about your work. Last year, I published my autobiography, and it's called, very obviously, named Zippy and Me. And um, it's in paperback, and it's got lots of pictures um, of stuff I've talked about today, really. Um, also my grandchildren, which is quite nice. But it gives you a, a really, you know, up to, well, almost up to date. It, I mean, obviously it doesn't have um, the Dark Crystal in, in it because, or Age of Resistance film, because that was sort of after the book was sent to the printers, it was already, you know, I wasn't allowed to talk about it anyway, so I couldn't do that. But um, I'd love people to buy that if they could. It's... Um, it's a it's a it's not a very large price. It's paperback and I think it's ten ninety nine or something. But um, you might even get it cheaper if you go on to um, places like um, Amazon and um, eBay and Waterstones sell it as well. But it's hopefully the bookshops have started to open now so you can get it um, in bookshops. But uh, and if they don't have it, get them to order it in. They will do. Um, uh, hopefully it just helps. It's my very first effort. I've, I did it with um wonderful couple called Duncan Barrett and Nuala Culvey and they're, they're a couple and they wrote, put it all in succinct. Well, Ronnie, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you for sharing your memories and anecdotes. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. No worries. Thank you. Cheers.
Bye. Bye. A big thanks to Ronnie for sharing his memories and do buy his book, Zippy and Me. That's it for now. A couple more episodes left of this series and I'll be back soon. See ya.